In this episode of Flying Through Time, we explore the development of a most remarkable fighter. It was a little plane that could easily keep the giants of its day in its gun sights. We also look at the company that produced this little marvel and see how it and other early manufacturers of aircraft have developed. The development of the Northrop F-5 began as far back as 1954, when a Northrop team toured Europe and Asia to examine the defence needs of NATO and CETO countries. The conclusion of the tour determined the need for a lightweight supersonic fighter that would be inexpensive to purchase, easy to maintain and capable of operating from short runways and poor quality airfields. With this criteria, the Northrop designers came up with the original blueprints for what would be the F-5. This baby fighter went from the drawing board to become one of the most successful export products of the US military aircraft industry. Although it didn't have the speed performance of some of its more costly contemporaries, it realized exactly the parameters it was designed for. Interestingly, the F-5 was not widely used by the US Air Force. The original plan for the F-5 was submitted to both the Air Force and the Navy. The Navy rejected the F-5 and the Air Force also wasn't enthusiastic. It saw no need for a lightweight fighter. However, it did require a new trainer. Northrop decided to meet this requirement, which was formalized in 1955. Undaunted by the US military's rejection of its baby-sized fighter, which was one quarter of the weight of the Phantom, the Northrop company decided to proceed with the development of the N-156F as a private venture. At a time when everything was getting bigger, faster and more complicated, the little F-5 was the opposite. The plane used the best technology in a solid airframe, but everything was kept as simple as possible. The two engines could be accessed or removed by taking off the lower part of the rear fuselage. They weighed only 585 pounds each and could be removed and refitted by human muscle alone. In fact, engine removal and replacement could be achieved in 20 minutes. Over 24% of the plane's surface consisted of easily removable panels that allowed fast access to all the major components of the aircraft. The components were arranged to be only one deep to increase the speed of servicing or replacing modules or parts. Even the diagnostic testing equipment was portable. In a combat situation, this meant the plane would have less downtime than any sonic jet fighter before it. The first flight for the F-5 was during 1959, and it wasn't until three years later that Northrop would receive its first order. This occurred when the US decided that rather than sell aging planes to their allies, they would supply them with better aircraft. This aircraft was the F-5. On August 9, 1962, the model N-156F was given the official designation of F-5A, and the official name was Freedom Fighter. Northrop was also permitted by the US government to supply the Freedom Fighter under the terms of the Military Assistance Program and the Foreign Military Sales Program. A total of 1,871 F-5s were built by Northrop, and a further 776 were built under license in Canada, Spain, Switzerland, Korea and Taiwan. The F-5 is still an important part of many foreign air forces.
For many countries, this would be the first time that they had such sophisticated fighters. The toughness of the aircraft made it suitable for impoverished allies. This is an F-5 demonstrating its ability to use a very secondary type runway. No other fighter of its day could land on such a strip. Or if it did, the practice would be seen as bordering on the very dangerous. The armament included two nose-mounted 20mm cannons. Again, the access for maintaining the guns was like the rest of the maintenance procedures of the plane. It was easy and minimal training was required for a crew to be proficient in reloading or calibrating the sights. To add to the little fighter's punch, it could carry sidewinder missiles and a number of other types of freefall bombs. What is remarkable is that when pitted in military games and facing off with the heavy weights of air combat, the F-5 fighter won 85% of the time. The F-5 is only one example of the ability of the Northrop company to build defence planes. This company was one of many that formed the early commercial aviation industry. The Second World War accelerated aircraft development and placed these companies at the forefront of creativity and development. By the end of the war, the major aircraft developers had gained much new technology and this cemented their future and their place in the aircraft defence industry. Only a few new manufacturers would emerge after the Second World War. In fact, over the past decade, the number of defence contractors has reduced from over 50 to about 10. This reduction is due in part to the consolidation of many of the main players of the early days. Northrop is an example of such consolidation, as it merged with the famous Grumman Company and purchased another aviation icon, Vought. The Grumman Company brought a host of famous planes and technological breakthroughs to defence aircraft. The Grumman philosophy when designing the Hellcat was make it strong, make it simple and make it work. The Hellcat was in fact a reasonably simple machine and it was definitely tough and it did work extraordinarily well. The Hellcat is said to be the plane that won the Pacific Theatre of World War II. It got its reputation for its ruggedness and even when shot up badly, it could bring its pilot home. The Grumman Tomcat also became a legend. Regardless of the initial engine problems, the Tomcat was revolutionary and the pinnacle of what had been learnt from the early beginnings of building carrier-based aircraft. Vought's contribution to Northrop Grumman is the company's experience and technical knowledge gained by its development of many experimental planes. One of Vought's most famous planes is the carrier-based Corsair. Like the other surviving aircraft manufacturers of the World War II era, Northrop Grumman went on to space technology and have worked closely with NASA to further both space research and aviation. NASA's Ames Flight Research Facility has assisted many manufacturers to test and develop aircraft. The experimental craft, the X-29, was a Grumman development plane and is an example of such joint experiments with NASA. 
It's interesting to note the closeness that has led to the merging of companies as the Grumman X-29 used a Northrop F5 fuselage and nose landing gear. The multi-phase program was conducted from 1984 to 1992 and was to provide engineering data to assist in the design and development of future aircraft. The forward swept wings of the X-29 present a number of advantages, but have a fatal tendency to warp upward under pressure. To counter this, NASA and Grumman developed a new wing technology called aeroelastic tailoring and new composite materials to build wings from. The outcome was a wing that still deformed under pressure, but instead of having a negative effect, the new wing deformed to set specifications to improve the flight characteristic. This is just one example of how natural it was for the emerging giants of World War II aircraft manufacturers to consolidate their technology and resources. The F-5A was an agile, well-performing aircraft, but it had been built primarily with the air-to-ground role in mind and was not well equipped for air-to-air -air combat. Northrop thought the basic design would make an effective air-to-air -air fighter by using more powerful engines and equipping it with radar and advanced avionics. Northrop tested the General Electric J85 turbojet, which had a ninth compressor stage and used titanium rather than steel blades. The increased thrust of the J85 GE21 gave improvements in speed, climb, endurance, range and throttle response. On February 26, 1970, the U.S. Air Force asked for bids from eight companies. Four companies entered the competition, Vought, McDonnell and Northrop, with an upgraded version of the F-5AB. On November 20, 1970, the Northrop entry was declared the winner of the competition and an initial contract was placed for five development and 325 production aircraft. On December 28, 1970, the F-5A-21 was officially reclassified as F-5E. The aircraft later became known as Tiger II. The original F-5 was so good that little alteration was required. The wings were a complete unit, which gave the plane great rigidity. Some steel and titanium was used, but it was mostly a riveted aluminium construction. The combat system was upgraded and the plane received a vastly improved fire control radar and a computer control tracking system, which gave the pilot radar detection range tracking and lead computations. The fuselage of the F-5A21 was 15 inches longer and 16 inches wider than that of the F-5A. The extra fuselage space enabled the fitting of larger fuel tanks, increasing internal fuel capacity from 585 to 671 gallons. Northrop's F-5A21 placed emphasis on maneuverability rather than on high speed. This model had a 23% improvement in sea level rate of climb, a 17% improvement in sustained turn rate, a 39% improvement in turn in radius, and 7% in instantaneous turn rate. Maximum speed increase from Mach 1.4 to Mach 1.6. The first F-5E was rolled out at Hawthorne on June 23, 1972 and was sent to Edwards Air Force Base for flight testing. The aircraft took off on its maiden flight on August 11, 1972, with Hank Show 2 at the controls. It was in Vietnam that the F-5 really proved its potential. It was the outstanding success of the little fighter in Vietnam that made the US military pay attention to a fighter they'd overlooked for so long. 
In October 1965, the U.S. Air Force borrowed 12 combat-ready F-5s and turned them over to the 403rd Tactical Fighter Wing for operational service trials. After a few small modifications, which included in-flight refueling capability, armor plating and pylons that could be jettisoned, the planes were sent into action. The program, which was a test for the F-5A-21s, was given the codename Scotia Tiger. This was the start of the F-5 being recognized by its own country. It was after the success of Vietnam that the F-5E was commissioned. The E was given the name Tiger II in recognition of the F-A-21's outstanding performance in this theater. They were also redesignated F-5C. More than 4,000 combat hours were logged in over 3,500 combat sorties for the loss of two aircraft. As compared to other aircraft, the bomb aiming and delivery system of the F-5 was relatively unsophisticated. Most weapons deliveries were made from a shallow dive, with the pilot judging the range by using his lead computing gun sight. A 150-gallon drop tank was usually carried on the centerline pylon, with an additional 150-gallon tank being carried on each of the inboard underwing pylons. Although the load-carrying capability of the F-5 was not as great as that of other types such as the F-4 Phantom and the F-105 Thunder Chief, the Northrop fighter was fast and agile, making it ideal for dodging ground fire during attack runs. The F-5's flight-ready maintenance was an incredibly low 6.5 hours per flight much lower than Northrop's estimation of 21 hours per flight. Mission abort rate was 1.5%. Although it was supersonic, the US military thinking of the day was faster is better and preferred to invest in planes that could easily beat the F-5 in top speed. But realistically, when two fighter craft identify each other as enemies, speed drops off and close combat begins. Each pilot tries to manoeuvre his plane for the advantage and the kill. It was in this mode of combat that the little F-5 was the master. This was proved in the dissimilar air combat training program, which is run at the Top Gun School and Red Flag exercises. Instructors used the F-5 and the Top Gun pilots flew the US military's frontline fighters like the Tomcat. The instructors fly as aggressors and the Top Gun's job is to destroy the threat. What's interesting is that at no time throughout the running of the program has any US commissioned frontline fighter ever been able to clearly outfly the little F-5. To add to the F-5's advantage is this sobering fact. Only F-14 Tomcats and F-15 Eagles could claim a very small kill advantage over the F-5. However, the F-14 and 15 are more than twice the price of an F-5. The realization is that if a compiled fleet of F-5s and F-14s of an equal dollar for dollar value were put into a combat scenario, the F-5 would outnumber the F-14 by more than two to one. In this realization, the baby F-5 would win hands down. In 1975, the US Navy Fighter Weapons School borrowed a total of 10 F-5Es and three F-5Fs from the US Air Force for use in the program.
the F5G was the final variation of the F5 series of planes, and it was vastly superior to the Tiger II. This was the only real major revamp of the F5, and it was called the Tiger Shark. An effort was made to keep the weight down. It was only 17% greater than that of the F5E, but packed a massive 60% increase of engine thrust. This was achieved by using the engines from the F18 Hornet. The maximum speed exceeded Mach 2, and the climb rate was phenomenal. The size increase didn't negatively affect the plane's outstanding maneuverability. This time, the plane was an absolute total package. It had kept all its attributes and answered the US critics regarding its top speed. Yet again, the F-5 was ignored by the military forces of the United States. Worse news was to come for the F-5G program. At about this time, the US government had closed the door to selling its high-tech military equipment to other countries, and this evaporated the international market for the F-5G. After spending more than a billion dollars on the project, the Northrop Corporation officially terminated the program on November 17, 1986. And that ended the production of a most remarkable little fighter. The baby plane was the most successful export fighter of its time. Yet it was never fully accepted in its homeland. That concludes another edition of Flying Through Time. Join us again when we continue to explore our fascinating history of aviation.